Chapter 1. What the FAFSA is. FAFSA stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. This is essentially your loan application for an education loan. The FAFSA form has a deadline of June 30, 2012. You will need the FAFSA form when applying for loans, grants, and scholarships. Remember, the FAFSA is a free application. There are many companies that charge you to fill it out, but you can do it yourself for free. Save some time and money and follow our simple video series to fill out the FAFSA form correctly. If you want to know more about how a loan is different from a grant or a scholarship, please check fafsaloanhelp.com. Don't forget, after the video, share it with your friends on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Google+. Chapter 2. What documents you will need before you start the FAFSA. Before you start the application, it is important that you gather the right info to help you save some time later. You will need the following. First, a copy of your tax return from the previous year. For instance, if you are applying for aid in 2011, you will need your 2010 tax return. If you do not have the tax return, check out fafsaloanhelp.com for more info. Two, you will also need your W-2 forms from all employers in the past year. You may also need your spouse's W-2 and parent's W-2. Three, if you have received Social Security, unemployment benefits, or workers' comp benefits in the last year, you may need to provide statements proving those benefits. And four, those docs take care of your financial proof, but you may also be required to prove your citizenship or residency status. Keep a copy of your Social Security card and green card handy. The last thing you will need before starting a FAFSA application is what is called a PIN. The PIN is your personal identification number which helps the government find your application in the future if there are any questions. To get a PIN, you must go to www.pin.ed.gov. Getting the PIN is free. If you need help with the PIN, go to fafsaloanhelp.com. Chapter 3. Important Things to Remember About the FAFSA Form 1. It is important that you do not lie on this application. Anyone who tells you to send in false information should be reported to the government immediately. 2. Write as clear as possible. Use all caps in all fields. Since you may make a mistake, print off two copies of the form. 3. For your final version of the form, make sure you to use black ink only. 4. If you ever have a question about a field, don't guess. Go to fafsaloanhelp.com and do a quick search. If you can't find your answer, simply email in and we will answer your question for free. 5. Another huge item on the FAFSA form is determining if you are independent or dependent. This will set up a series of answers on the FAFSA. You are considered to be independent if you meet one of the following criteria. A. You were born before January 1, 1988. B. You are married. C. You will be working on a master's or a doctorate program. D. You are currently serving on active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces. E. You are a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces. F. Have children. G. You have dependents, other than your children or spouse, who live with you. H. You are in foster care or a dependent ward of the state. I. You are an emancipated minor as recognized by your state of residence. Or J. If you are or have been considered an unaccompanied minor or homeless youth. Chapter 4. Filling out Section 1 of the FAFSA. Great! We're finally into the actual application. We're going to walk you through each field and answer some questions that we hear from our users. Remember, the yellow fields are fields the prospective student, that's you, should be filling out. Purple fields are for your parents. Field 1. Make sure you enter in your last name here. We often see people enter in their first name. If your name is longer than the allotted space, just enter in as much as you can. 
The most important thing to remember is that the name must match what is on your Social Security card. If you have married, it will be important to use the name that is on your Social Security card. Field 2. First Name The same goes for this field as Field 1. It must match your Social Security card. Field 3. Middle Initial Pretty simple, right? Field 4. Number and street of your mailing address. Enter in your current mailing address. It is best to use a physical address instead of a post office box. To denote the number of your apartment or unit number, simply put APT, apartment, and then the number. If you're stationed overseas and no longer have a U.S. mailing address, use the military base's mailing address. If you come back from deployment early for some reason, make sure to update your FAFSA application immediately. Field 5. The name of your city. Once again, if your city name is longer than the field, enter in as much as you can. Field 6. Enter in your two-letter state abbreviation. If you do not know your state abbreviation, please check fafsaloanhelp.com. Field 7. Your zip code is your current mailing zip code. Field 8. Social Security Number. This, this is one of the most important fields in the entire application. Enter in your nine-digit Social Security Number very clearly. Field 9. Enter in your date of birth with the two-digit month. For instance, February is 02, October 10. The day in two-digit format and the year in four-digit format. Field 10. Your permanent phone number. We all know that people move a lot these days. Use your cell as your primary phone if you don't anticipate on changing this phone number. But make sure to pick up the phone and check your voicemail often. Field 11. Driver's license number. Usually at the top of your license. If you don't have a license, put a zero in the field. If you are a military member, enter in the license number you have. Don't worry if you're not living at that address anymore. Field 12. Driver License State. Essentially, where you got your driver's license. Once again, you don't need to be living there right now. Field 13. Your email address. Many people have more than one email address. Use the email address that you check the most. We suggest that you don't use a work email address. If your email address is longer than the field, make a new email address and forward that address to your older one but make sure to check your spam folder often for any messages from the government. Field 14. Are you a U.S. citizen? So this question is fairly straightforward for most people. If you're born in the U.S. and a citizen, simply answer yes. But if you moved to the U.S. and got your green card, color in the circle next to no, but I am an eligible non-citizen. If you are not a citizen or do not have a green card, Fill in the last box. Field 15. Alien Registration Number. This is the number on the top of your green card. Field 16. What is your marital status as of today? If you have filed for a divorce but it has not completely gone through yet, answer separated. If you are in a same-sex marriage, the federal government does not recognize this yet, so you may need to answer single. Be prepared to explain this in the future. Field 17. Month and year of your relationship status changed. Pretty simple. If you cannot remember or do not have an official record, check with your local hall of records. Field 18. What is your state of legal residence? Where's the last place you had a mailing address and claimed residency? For military members, use the state you last lived in before deployment overseas. This does not have to be the same as your mailing address, which we filled out earlier on the form. Field 19. When did you become a resident of the state? Field 20. Simply enter in the date when you became a resident. Field 21. Select your gender. If you do not wish to identify your gender, you may receive an incomplete application response. Field 22. If you are male, you must register with the Selective Service to be eligible for financial aid. This is usually done when you turn 18. If you don't remember doing this, please check this box. Don't worry, there has not been a draft in a long time. Females do not have to fill out this field.
Field 23. So, the drug conviction question. If you have a criminal record or conviction, the FAFSA is only interested to know if you were convicted while you were getting some sort of financial aid. If you had a conviction, but it was during a time when you were not receiving aid, you can answer no to this question. If for some reason you need to call the 800 number on the form, be prepared to explain your situation as it was recorded by the police officer. Field 24 and 25. Some colleges take into account if your parents have received a high school or college degree. If for some reason you do not know your father or mother's history, just enter in other slash unknown. This may limit your financial aid options. Also, if you have a stepfather or a stepmother, you can enter in their info instead of your birth parents' data. One of the parents listed on your app must be a birth parent, though. Field 26. This question is asking you if you were beginning college in 2011 or 2012. If you have completed high school or a GED, you can only pick one choice. Field 27. Enter in your high school's name. If you received a GED, you may leave this blank. Also, if you've been homeschooled, you may leave this blank. Field 28. This question is asking if you will have completed your first bachelor degree before 2011. This is mainly for graduate students applying for master or doctoral programs. Field 29. The grade level question can be tricky for some. The best way to look at this is by how many credits you have earned. For instance, if you are in your fourth semester, but you've only completed 12 credits, you are technically a first-year student. Field 30. This question is asking what type of program you will be working on. It's okay to answer other slash undecided if you are not sure yet. However, we recommend answering first bachelor degree in most cases. Field 31. A work-study program is where you may be learning on the job and receiving credits for your time. Congrats on getting to the end of Section 1 on the FAFSA. Now is a good time to go back and check your answers and look for any errors. If you have any further questions at this point, go to fafsaloanhelp.com. Chapter 5, Section 2 of the FAFSA Application. This section is dedicated to information about you, the student. The key to this section is to make sure you're answering on behalf of your spouse also if you're married. Once again, remember the federal government does not recognize same-sex marriages. If you are in a same-sex marriage, enter in the data as if you were single. Field 32. This question is asking if you have already filled out your 2010 tax return. If you do not plan on filing one, you are essentially saying you are a dependent. Field 33. This question is asking what form you used to file in 2010. If you don't remember, check your records. Most people will have filed Form 1040 or 1040EZ. If you used a system like TurboTax, you can log in there and find out what form you filed for last year. Field 34. This is asking if you are eligible to file Form 1040EZ, which is for people earning less than $100,000 per year. Field 35. The Adjusted Gross Income is simply asking you to look up your income on the form that you used to file your 2010 taxes. Once again, if you do not have this form, you will need to find it. Do not guess on this field or enter false information. Field 36. Once again, asking for income from just your spouse on the 2010 filing. If you filed separately, you will need your spouse's tax returns. Once again, do not lie or enter false information. Field 37. Your spouse may have had a list of exemptions. These can be found on the 2010 tax forms. Field 38 and 39. These questions are asking how much you made in total for 2010. There are several ways of finding this info. One is to look on your W-2 form. If you have more than one W-2, add them up. You can also use your tax returns to find the income. If you need help finding this value, check out fafsaloanhelp.com. Field 40. These questions are asking how much money you might have in your sock drawer, bank accounts, etc. Log into your online bank and check the balance as of today. Add that up and you've got your value. Field 41. Your investment value net worth can be trickier to calculate. 
If you own stocks or have a 401k, you will need to access the value of those investments in today's value. For instance, if you bought one stock share in Google at $200, but today it's valued at $530, you will need to enter in $530. If you own art or things that may not have a specific market value, simply use an appraisal value. And remember, do not include the value of your home that you live in currently. If you own another property and it has a mortgage, enter in the equity value of the property, not the total value. For more info, check out fafsaloanhelp.com. Field 42. This is pretty much the same as Field 41, but it is related to the business instead of the personal assets. Okay, we're going to pause this chapter here. The next two questions are a bit more in-depth, and we think they deserve their own chapter in this video series. Chapter 6, Section 2, Question 43 and 44. We decided to break out Question 43 and 44 on the FAFSA form as their own chapter because they are relatively complex and do require some detail. Field 43. In Question 43, the FAFSA is looking for financial information about your taxable earnings. Part A of Question 43 is pretty straightforward. Simply take the value from your 2010 tax form, line 49 if you filed Form 1040, or line 31 if you filed Form 1040A. For more information about what an education credit is, check out fafsaloanhelp.com. Part B is about child support. If you are paying child support for a child that does not live in your home, enter in that value here. If you are supposed to be paying child support but are currently not, put in the amount you are supposed to be paying. Remember, this question is asking how much you are paying for child support, not receiving. Part C. This question is asking how much you earned from need-based employment programs. A need-based employment program is usually a job that you take part-time to help you pay for school. You should get a W-2 form for this income. Most people have jobs like internships, fellowships, or working at the school itself as work-study programs. If you need more information on what is a work-study program, go to fafsaloanhelp.com. Part D. This question is asking you to total up all of your grant and scholarship aid that you have received. Now, you may be asking yourself, is my scholarship taxable? The answer depends on if the scholarship is purely for tuition or if it can be used as a stipend. If it is purely for tuition, it is not taxable. If it can be used for other expenses like rent, it may be taxable. To truly verify if your scholarship aid is taxable, please check the IRS website. There's a link to the education section on our site, fafsaloanhelp.com. Part E. This section is asking how much you may have earned in combat pay. This only applies to military members. If you are not in the military, put a zero in the field. This pay amount will be on your W-2 in Box 12 or 14. If you did not receive a W-2 from your military branch, contact your troop leader immediately. Part F. This question is asking how much you may have earned during a semester where you were working and earning credits through a monitored program. If your school does not have a specific co-op program, put a zero in the field. Question 44. This series of questions will focus on your untaxed income. This is essentially money you have earned but have not paid tax on yet. If you are married, make sure to approach this section with the total value from both you and your spouse. Part A. Payments to a tax-deferred pension, etc., is asking you how much money you may have placed into a pension fund or a 401k retirement plan. This amount will show up on your W-2 since the money goes directly into those plans from your employer pre-tax. Part B, IRA deductions and payments, is talking about money you may have set aside in a retirement account which is technically pre-tax. Once again, this info will show up on your tax forms. If none of these terms sound familiar, don't worry, a large portion of people have not put money into a pension or IRA account. But if you're looking to start saving for the future, check out fafsaloanhelp.com for a list of recommended retirement planners and accounts. Starting to save early in life is a huge advantage. Part C. Child support is any money you may have received as part of a court judgment. 
For instance, if the father of your baby is sending you money, write down the total of that value in this field. The amount you enter is the yearly amount that you got in 2010. Part D. Sometimes investments make interest income which may not be taxable. Once again, refer to your tax form to get the values for this. In most cases, put a zero in the field. Part E. Untaxed distributions from your IRA. Now, what this means is if you took out any money from your retirement account early. Usually this will be blank since most people won't take money from an IRA until they are retired. If you did take something out, it will show up on your 2010 tax forms. Part F. This is essentially the same as question E, but related to your pension. Once again, most people will enter zero here. Part G. This question is looking for a total of the money that you received as a military or clergy member for housing, food, or other allowances. If you are not a clergy member or not part of the military, put a zero in the field. Part H. In question 44H, if you are a veteran of the U.S. military, you will need to total up any money you received for payments, like a disability payment or VA educational work study allowance. If you are not a veteran, put a zero in the field. Part I. Now this field is a bit of a doozy. It is a catch-all for other types of untaxed income. Usually this amount comes from payments like workers' comp, disability payments. In this question on the form, there's a list of things not to include. Pay special attention to that list. Once again, in most cases, just enter zero. If you have received unemployment benefits, these may be considered untaxed income if they were not included in your adjusted gross income. Part J. Another catch-all question. This is asking if anyone paid your bills for you or gave you significant money gifts during the year. Try to be as accurate as possible in this question. If you didn't have any other assistance, just enter zero. Well, congratulations, we're at the end of step two of the FAFSA. Now is a good time to go back and check your information. If you have any questions, go to fafsaloanhelp.com. Chapter seven, step three of the FAFSA. Questions 45 to 57 are simple yes or no questions. If you are using a paper application, make sure to fill in the circle fully with a black ink pen. Okay, let's run through these questions. Question 45. You should know your birthday. This is establishing if you are older than 22 years old. Question 46. Are you married? Once again, if you are in a same-sex marriage, you should answer single for the purposes of this application. If you are separated but not divorced, just answer yes to this question. Question 47. This question is trying to figure out what type of program you will be putting the money towards. If you are applying for a master level program or above, answer yes here. If you are applying for an associate or a bachelor program, answer no. Question 48. So, this is one of those wonderful questions which is asked in a really odd way. First of all, it only applies to military members. However, everyone should fill in an answer. If you are not part of the military, just answer no. If you are part of the U.S. military on active duty, you may need to answer yes. If you are just training, you will answer no. Question 49. This is just asking if you have served in the U.S. military with an honorable discharge. If you didn't have an honorable discharge, you should answer no. You are technically not eligible for veteran benefits. Question 50. This question is pretty simple. Do you have kids? If you do, are you paying for the majority of their expenses? If so, answer yes. If you don't have kids, simply answer no. Question 51. Other dependents might be grandparents or other family members living with you that you are financially responsible for. If you have those people in your life, answer yes. The two conditions are that they must live with you and you must be paying for more than half of their support monthly. Question 52. This question is asking if you have been under foster care. Question 53. An emancipated minor is a person who essentially asked to be called an independent adult and be technically separated from their parents. You may need to provide proof of the emancipation. For most people, the answer will be no. Question 54. A legal guardianship is essentially if you have a person appointed by a court to take care of you or to be your guardian. 
This happens in cases when your birth parents pass away or if you've been emancipated at a very early age. Question 55. This question is asking if you were considered to be homeless by a local social worker. Question 56. Once again, this question is asking if you are considered to be homeless by a specific government agency. Question 57. Okay, one more time. They're going to ask you if you were homeless. Quick section, right? Now, there are no right or wrong answers in this section. If you answered yes to any one of those questions, you will be considered independent for the purposes of this application. If you answered no to everything, you are essentially being considered a dependent. If you have answered yes to any of the questions in Step 3, we have some good news for you. You can completely skip Section 4 and go straight to Step 5. One group, the health students, may need to fill out Section 4 even if they are independent. Check with your school first. Now, for the folks who answered no to everything, let's hop on over to Section 4. Chapter 8, Section 4 of the FAFSA. Section 4 of the FAFSA covers all of the aspects of your parents' information. This section should be filled out with your parents since it is in purple on the printed form. If for some reason you are not with both of your birth parents, enter in at least one birth parent's information. If you do not know your birth parents and have been legally adopted, just enter in your adopted parents' information. If in the off chance you do not know anything about your parents and you do not have a legal guardian, simply leave this section blank. However, your college will ask you for more information later on to explain why you may have left this section blank. Be prepared to answer those questions in person or over the phone. Okay, let's jump into the questions. Are your parents watching with you? If not, go get them. Question 58. Are your parents married, single, divorced, or widowed? If your parents are a same-sex couple in a marriage, please enter in single, since the federal government does not recognize same-sex marriages at the moment. Question 59. This is simply asking when they were married or divorced, etc. Just a month and a year is needed. Question 60 through 67. You will need your father's and your mother's social security number and name here. The name on the social security card must be the same as the one you enter in here. If your parents do not have a social security card, they should apply for one with the Social Security Administration. You can find a link on fafsaloanhelp.com. Question 68. Enter in your parents' email address. If for some odd reason your parents are still living in the Stone Age and don't have an email address, Set one up on gmail.com for free. Make sure to show them how to use it. Question 69. Where does your parent claim their primary residence? Question 70. Did they start living in this state before 2006? Question 71. Just asking when they started living there. Question 72. This is asking you to total up how many people live at your parents' house legally. This could include parents, kids, grandparents, and any other relatives that live there full-time. Your parents must provide half of their support for them to be featured in this total. Question 73. During the 2011 to 2012 time span, how many people will be in college at the same time? If it is just you, enter in one. If it is you and your brother or sister, enter in two. Question 74 through 78 is asking if your parents or anyone in your parents' household have received any types of these aid. Remember, in some states, food stamps may have different names. Question 79. This question is asking if your parents have already completed their previous year's tax return, in this case, 2010. Question 80. This is just asking what form your parents used when filing. If you're not sure, you can ask your parents' accountant or have them check the online software that they may have used. Question 81. Your parents would be eligible to file Form 1040-A if they had earned less than $100,000. Now, even if they are eligible to fill out this form, they may have filled out a different form. Question 82. A dislocated worker is a person who may have been laid off or lost their job and is collecting unemployment benefits. If your parent has quit their job, they are usually not considered to be a dislocated worker. Answer yes if they've been laid off or lost their job. Going into the next series of questions, you will need your parents' tax return forms. Make sure you have those ready. 
This area is very similar to Section 2 you filled out earlier for yourself. However, if you have questions, just go to fafsaloanhelp.com and get answers for free there. Question 83. On Question 83, it is asking for your parents' adjusted gross income. Now, if you live with your mom and stepfather, please include your stepfather's income here. The form will show you which fields to look at on their tax returns to get the right value. Question 84. This is asking how much your parents paid in income tax in 2010. Make sure to use your parents' most recent tax form. If they filed an extension or supplemental information, use the data from that tax return since that will be the most accurate. Question 85. This question focuses on the various exemptions your parents may have claimed. It is not super important that you know about each exemption, but you do need to know about the total they entered in their tax return. Question 86 and 87. These two questions are focused on figuring out your parents' total earned income for 2010. This value may come from their W-2 form. For these fields, you will enter in the gross income they earned, so before taxes. Question 88. This question simply asks how much your parents have in their bank accounts and or cash. Just total that up and enter in the value. Question 89. This question can be a bit tricky sometimes since your parents may have many investments. To get an accurate value quickly, you can either contact their accountant or you can just total up the estimated value on paper. Take into account any properties they might own outside of the home you live in and any stocks they may own. For a full list of things to include, go to fafsaloanhelp.com. Question 90. Yet another tricky field. It is sometimes hard to value a business. The easiest way to do this is to contact their business accountant. Most small businesses will have an accountant to talk to. Question 91 and 92 deal with other types of income that your parents may have received in the last year. A lot of this info will come from their tax return, so make sure you have that handy. Question 91A. Did your parents receive any education credits during the last year? These would have been declared on their tax forms. Question 91B. Were either of your parents paying child support to kids not living at their house? Enter in that value here. Question 91C. Did either of your parents earn money from working at a school while they were studying at the school? This only applies to need-based income. If they were a professor and studying at the same time, most likely this doesn't qualify. If they didn't earn anything, just enter zero. Question 91D. Did either of your parents get scholarship money or student grants in the last year? What was the value of those? If not, put a zero in the field. Question 91E. If either of your parents were in the military, did they receive combat pay? If they were not in the military, just enter zero. Question 91F. Did your parents participate in a college-sponsored co-op program? very similar to a work-study program. If not, just enter zero. Question 92A. This question focuses on how much your parents contributed to their retirement pension or 401k in the past year only. Do not include the total value of their retirement fund. If they didn't make any contributions to a retirement plan, just enter zero. Please remember these contributions must be to a tax-deferred retirement plan. So if they put aside some money after they got paid and it was already taxed, this does not count. Question 92B. This is very similar to 92A, but focuses on different types of accounts, like an IRA or a co-plan. If they didn't have these, simply enter zero. Question 92C. Did either of your parents receive child support during the past year? If so, just include that value here. Question 92D. This is interest income your parents may have earned, and it is somehow tax exempt. It is shown on their tax forms. Question 92E. If they somehow took out money from their IRA and they were not taxed, just include the amount that they took out from their IRA in the past year. This is usually pretty rare, and if they didn't take anything out, put a zero in the field. Question 92F. This is asking pretty much the same thing as 92E, but it is related to money that might have been taken out of a pension account and not taxed. 
Question 92G. If your parents were clergy members or part of the military, did they receive housing or food allowances in the past year? If so, just enter in that total value. Question 92H. In this field, you are going to total up how much your parents might have made if they were a veteran receiving payments. Some of the most common payments as a veteran are disability payments or a death pension benefit. If you are not sure about what some of these terms are, simply check on fafsaloanhelp.com. Question 92i. This is a catch-all question for anything that wasn't added up earlier. Simply use the tax form your parents submitted as a reference. If you need more guidance about what should not be included here, check out fafsaloanhelp.com. Some of the most common things not to include are student aid, welfare, untaxed social security benefits, combat pay, etc. Awesome work! We are almost done! Now we're at the end of step four. Once again, it's a good time to go back and check your answers and make sure you didn't make any mistakes or skip any really important questions. Chapter 9. Step 5 of the FAFSA. This section is super simple and it just focuses on figuring out how many people are in your household. It is important to note that this is only for students who are considered independent by Step 3 of the FAFSA. If you've answered yes to any of the questions, you are independent. If you are dependent or answered no to everything in Step 3, you can skip this section. Question 93. Just add up how many people live in your household. If you have people who live in your house but do not take care of them in any financial way, do not include them. For instance, if you have a cousin living with you but he has his own job and pays rent, do not include him. Question 94. This is just asking how many people will be in college during the same year. Question 95 through 99 is focused on seeing if you or anyone in your household has received food stamps, supplemental security income, etc. Remember, food stamps have different names in each state. Question 100. Wow, are we at a hundred questions? You're certainly a trooper, and the good news is we are almost done. This question is asking if you or your spouse has been laid off in the past year and is currently unemployed. This would mean you are receiving unemployment benefits. If you or your spouse quit your job, you are not eligible to be called a dislocated worker. Simple section, right? Okay, only two more to go, and these are short. Chapter 10, Step 6. Choosing which colleges you are applying to. Each school has its own federal ID, which is a six-digit code. You will need this code for each school that you are applying to. To find this code, you can either contact your school's financial aid officer or look it up on the fafsaloanhelp.com website. This list is usually broken up by state. If you are applying to an online school, simply look up the school by name. The online school will have one code no matter what state you are studying from. If you are applying to more than four schools, simply attach another sheet to the printed FAFSA application. Question 101 goes in the following format. Enter in your school code, the name of the school, its address, and the state where it is registered. For instance, if you're applying to the University of Phoenix, the school is headquartered in Arizona. In the housing field, indicate if you're planning on living on campus or studying from home or living with your parents. If you are planning on attending an online school, just enter in that you will be off campus or at a parent's house. Now, this is a very important section to double-check carefully. Make sure the school code is correct. This is one of the most important fields on the entire application. Chapter 11, Step 7. This is the last step. Congratulations on making it this far. You're doing great, and soon you'll be sending this application in, feeling way more relieved. So in this section, all you really need to do is sign it, date it, and have your parents sign it also. There is also a little section to fill out if you've used a third party to fill out the application. If you did it yourself, simply leave that section blank. It is also important to not fill in any information in the box that says College Use Only. 
Now, the other part of this last section is realizing that you are applying for a loan, scholarship, or grant and entering into a contract. The small print in this box is important. It states that you are applying for money to use for school, not to spend on new shoes or a new cell phone. Remember, a federal student loan is not something you can get out of by claiming bankruptcy. It must be paid back. We cannot make this any clearer. If you have previously defaulted on a student loan, you are no longer eligible to apply for a new loan. The other major part of this fine print is that you are authorizing the government to check your data and look at your financial records. If you're not sure what the fine print means, feel free to send us an email and ask a question at fafsaloanhelp.com. Well, that's it. You are done with the FAFSA application. Chapter 12. What happens next? If you have chosen to do the printed copy of the FAFSA, you will need to mail it in. If you have submitted the form electronically, make sure you get an email confirmation that your application has been received. Check your spam folder. It will take some time before you hear anything back. Sometimes the government or school may come back to you with questions about your application. Be prepared to answer these questions. A few good things to do to stay organized. One. Make a copy of all of your documents and keep them in a folder which is easily accessible. 2. Check with your school to see if they received the application. 3. Put in reminders in your phone calendar of any upcoming deadlines. 4. Start planning your college classes. It's never too early to plan. Thanks for watching our video series. If you know of someone who could use this information, feel free to send it along with a Facebook link below. You can also email them a link below too. Good luck on your new education!